Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the message that you have given to Bob. Thank, thank you for his willingness to listen faithfully to you. May he preach it boldly and as you sent it. And may we receive it with open ears and open hearts. Mm -hmm. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thanks, Ma. Good morning. My name is Pastor Bob, and I get to be, I get to be, I get to be one of the pastors here at Mount Tabor United Methodist Church. I'm back out on my porch, but thanks once more for the blessing of worshiping our Lord alongside you. And yes, I said, and I mean alongside. I pray this greeting finds you well, and thanks a bunch for queuing us up. It is Mother's Day, and in olden times, like last year, when the landscape was a little less loony, Conservative estimates posited that 10 million cards would be sent to mom, and that's the old-fashioned kind. Phone calls would increase by 40%. There would be about 75 million more people eating out that day than a usual Sunday. But perhaps the biggest indicator of the nature of the day is that NASCAR would not run on Mother's Day. NASCAR doesn't take the day off in season, but you don't run on Mama's Day. That brought to mind a scene from the movie Primary Colors, a fictionalized account of the 1992 Clinton campaign for president. The candidate is sitting with some friends and some staff and mama stories rule the conversation. At the under, other end of the table, other staff are weighing, weighing campaign strategies and one asks of the candidate's wife, shouldn't we include the candidate in this discussion? She replies, nah, he's in a mamathon. That could go on all night in the South. Don't miss with mama. This is a picture of my mama, Edie. She was born in Amesbury, Massachusetts on June 22nd, 1933 and died in Sandwich, New Hampshire on March 19th, 1994. Two locales, just two hours apart, but mom traveled a lot of geography, saw a lot of life. I miss her, but take comfort in knowing she'd really like how things turned out for her boy. It took a bit, but things aren't, turned out pretty well. Before she moved north to New Hampshire, mom and I had a steady date on Thursdays. We'd go grocery shopping at Market Basket, she for her household and me for mine, which necessitated separate shopping carts and separate agendas. I used to love when we parted company because it would afford me one of my favorite moments of our time in the store. She'd be at one end of the aisle. I'd come around the corner at the other end, happen upon her pretty face and bellow, Hi, Edie, as if we were long lost comrades reuniting in the frozen foods. She'd try and feign chagrin, try and shush me, but you could tell she was charmed. It was my goofy little way of telling her how glad I was to be in her company, my goofy little way of telling her how glad I was that she was around. Glad she was around. In the midst of the COVID crisis, we may feel cause to question whether God cares if God's around. It's easy to leave him out. We're prone to live our lives on our own without seeking God or inquiring from God or depending on God. Clouds obscure the sun, storms obscure nature. Winter storms can sometimes obscure mountains and landscape. They can wreck your visibility so that you can only see what's right in front of you. We have a light that will never go dim and is always guiding us through uncertainty. There are many signs of God's presence all around us. Look at the signs of spring with new life coming forth. Look at the many acts of kindness and generosity and sacrifice people are making. The psalmist wrote that God's majesty and his majestic name fills the earth. His creation reveals him every day. I shouted aloud in Macket Basket, my delight in my mother's presence. Am I shouting aloud in all my days? My delight in my dad's? We're in week number three of our worship series titled Living with Hope. In week one, we looked at fear, its power, its antidote being the faith and courage God wishes for us. We looked at the three S's from the passage of John where Jesus appears suddenly to the disciples huddled in fear in the upper room, showing them who he is and then sending them out to share the good news of his love, life and resurrection, emboldened and empowered by the Holy Spirit that he has breathed into them. Doubt was weeks two, week two's topic and I said that I was not stopping the presses and asserting that we have long lived in an age of anxiety 
and the past couple of months have really raised the bar on fear and insecurity. There's a heightened sense that something is dreadfully amiss, that something is missing in our days. We don't know whom to trust. Everywhere there are scares and scams and miscues and misinformation. How can we trust God? How can we move to faith? In week three, we've considered loneliness. Loneliness is everywhere. And it was a concern long before the mandate of shelter at home became part of our vocabulary. We have more and more ways to touch base, yet we find ourselves isolated. Loneliness is cross-generational. Old and young folks are afflicted. One scientist concluded that loneliness is lethal. But into that alienation, God promises his presence for now and for all of time. The Bible declares that nothing can separate us from the love of God. The solution to overcoming loneliness can be found in growing closer to the Father and closer to his kids. Today, we're looking at living with hope by seeing God in all of creation, of relishing powerful and poignant reminders of his presence. Our scripture verse today is actually not a verse, but a whole Psalm, namely Psalm 8. Hear these words from the New, New Living Translation as Susan reads them. Of the book of Psalms, the theologian and professor Alan Ross wrote, of all the books in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms most vividly represents the faith of individuals in the Lord. The Psalms are the inspired responses of the human heart to God's revelation of himself in law and history and prophecy. Saints of all ages have appropriated this collection of prayers and praises in their public worship and private meditations. The book is actually a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs, and prayers, and among other things, serve as a glimpse into most of Israel's history. They have a number of authors, from David, who penned a few more than 70, to Asaph, responsible for about a dozen, to the sons of Korah, who tended to the upkeep of the temple and wrote 11 of the Psalms, Haman, one of the grandsons of Samuel, the guy who promoted King David, don't worry, this won't be on the quiz, at least not here, and his contemporary Ethan each crafted two of the Psalms. History's wisest man, Solomon, and the liberator of Israel's people, Moses, each wrote three. There are almost 50 Psalms whose authorship is still a mystery. Many of the Psalms were written for the temple choir, but we should not mistake this book for a hymnal. At some point in the period after Israel's exile to Babylon, these ancient poems were gathered together and arranged into the book of Psalms allowing them to evolve from just hymns per se, but prayers of both lament and praise to God. Did you hear that? Israel was at a point of graphic despair, seemingly estranged from the Father, and in the midst of that remorse, she knew that it was time to raise the bar on communicating with God, assembling a volume to do just that. It would be her way of reaching out, seeking his will, his protection, his counsel, his love, his presence. To return to Psalm 8 specifically, there are a couple of points that I really want to talk about specifically. In verse 2, the psalmist writes that God has taught children and infants to tell of his strength. Many of you know the story of Elias Acock, a warrior who has endured more in his almost three years than many of us endure in a lifetime. A lot of numbers will back me up on this, but the one that always slams me over the head is that in his first 365 days on earth, he was in the hospital, 320 of them. You talk about quarantine. In April of 2018, I got to see him prior to a surgery, 
And when I walked in, the wires and the tubes and the bars almost compelled me to turn around and walk back out. I'd seen them before, but something about this fragile frame up against their rigidity broke my heart. I tried to focus as best I could, not on his surroundings, but him. I stroked the back of his head and he raised up to look at me and I got the darndest picture in my head. It was this. For a moment I saw not Elias, but the famous training scene from the first of the Rocky movies where he's doing one-arm push-ups. I remember watching the scene and going home and doing some one-arm push-ups. Okay. A couple. Okay, I did one and then I couldn't get back up again. They're not easy. But back to the hospital. Elias wasn't just lifting his head to look at me. He was doing one-arm push-ups and a boatload more than Sylvester Stallone would ever pull off. But greater still was the look he gave me. And I felt then and I feel now that it was just like Stallone's look to his trainer. The okay sign. I was worried, I was uncertain, I was scared. And just then Elias, having shown the strength to pull a, a, off his own brand of one-arm push-ups, gave me the okay sign, letting me know that God had this, that God was present, and that there was nothing I needed to fear. A child of God taught me the strength of God. While it's not the intent of verse seven where we humans are reminded that God thinks so much of us that he gives us charge over everything, everything he has made like flocks and herds and birds and fish. I nonetheless found myself thinking of the animals and how they, like children, declare the strength of God. It's not the intent, but thanks for letting me go there. This is a picture of um, my brother-in-law, Mac, my brother-in-law, Ross, and my, uh, my dog, Max. When Ross came to live with us about a year ago, I wasn't quite sure if these two would see eye to eye. Ross had a, has had a hard life, but he's kind and generous and our household is made better because Ross is a part of it. But Ross is, shall we say, established in his ways. Max, well, isn't. Where Ross likes his privacy, Max thinks no door should be closed to him. Where Ross is cautious, Max tosses caution to the wind. Where Ross is quiet, Max is well aptly named. He does everything to the Max. Where Ross favors sanitary, Max slobbers. Where Ross is reserved, Max is robust. But Max unpacked Ross in his sweetness, his zeal for life, his love. Max licked Ross and shed dog hair on Ross and disquieted Ross right up to the point that he delighted Ross. The curmudgeon caved in the face of Max's conviviality. Max won him over and in doing so showed me just how majestic a name could be. Max broke through the facades and the fortresses that a hard life had constructed and showed me that ultimately presence and love triumph. And ain't that just like God? It's Mother's Day, and while it's not your typical's mo typical Mother's Day, as in this is not a time of typical, and there may not be 10 million cards and a 40% increase in phone calls and 75 million folks dining out, it is Mother's Day. And so I'm thinking about mine, Edie, while also being cognizant that for too many, their relationship with mom, with mom was less than ideal. And so I'm thinking about a moment in Macket Basket where it may have seemed like we were strangers when we were all together kin. I'm thinking about a moment when it may have seemed like we had parted company when we were all together right by each other's side. I'm thinking about a moment when our relationship may have seemed estranged, but it was altogether established. I'm thinking of a moment where mom may have seemed far away, but delighted in being altogether present. It's not a typical Mother's Day. It's a moment where God may seem to be a stranger, but is very much our kin. It's a moment when we may think that God has parted company with us, but he is right by our side. It's a moment when we may seem estranged from God, but we have never been more established in God because it's a moment when God may seem far away, but has never been more present. 
It's not a typical day, but I believe that today, that he is present today in all days. Do we believe that today? Well, do we? What are we going to do about it? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for Mother's Day. Thank you for your works and your words. Thank you for your love and your protection. But thank you most of all for your presence. Thank you that we see that in all things around us from the delight of spring to the gesture of kindness of strangers. Thank you that we see you everywhere if we just choose to look. Bless us in our day. May we, may we honor you. May we praise you. May we give thanks to you. Forgive us the times that we don't. We love you, Lord. We thank you for loving us first. I pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.